So imagine that this is uh, actually a frame that is moving in a windmill. Okay? So that this motion is caused by wind energy. And now we have a magnetic field that is generated by a magnet. So this frame just spins within a magnet, a magnetic field that now is static and not time varying. So still, this uh, structure would generate an electric current. And that makes you think that it's not whether the magnetic field is static or time varying that is responsible for this effect, which is a very fundamental effect. It's in the, the, is a foundational effect of renewables. Uh, so you can uh, see uh, that uh, the principle of converting wind power or even uh, uh, hydropower into electricity through uh, this uh, effect. So here you have a static magnet. However, because the frame is spinning, the flux that passes through the magnet varies with time. And Faraday was the one to actually put this in the form of a law, how this time varying magnetic flux, because this is the common effect that we see in both demonstrations. In this case, the magnetic field is constant. It's not time varying. But now the loop is spinning. So the common effect in both experiments is actually that the flux through the circuit varies with time. And it can vary with time either because the circuit remains constant and the magnetic flux changes with time, or the magnetic flux is constant and the circuit is moving and changing effectively with time. So with this in mind, uh, I will now go to the law that actually describes this effect, and this is Faraday's law, and we'll discuss how to apply it and what we can learn from it. So here I remind you what we saw in electrostatics, that the closed path integral of the electric field uh, is always zero. We interpreted that as the fact that the electrostatic field is conservative. You can indeed see this as the per unit charge work of the Coulomb force over a closed path. So the physical meaning of this is that the electric field is conservative or the electrostatic field to be more precise. So in all the fields that we have seen so far, you can confirm that this is true. And uh, for example, the uh, electric field from the line charge or the capacitor and so on. Faraday law says that this is not always true. So Faraday involves a geometry that we have seen in Ampere's law. It's actually the identical geometry of a closed loop C which I'm tracing in any way that I choose, either clockwise or counterclockwise. So let's say that I trace it like this. And this is the DL here. And I form the closed path integral of the electric field, the same closed path integral that appears in this uh, law of electrostatics. But now Faraday says that this won't be always zero. If you have time varying magnetic flux, that will be non-zero. And the quantity that this equals to can be found by a flux integral that is defined as follows. If you uh, imagine that you are using your right hand to trace the loop, and then your thumb points upwards, your thumb points in the direction where you define a surface, differential surface element ds. It's the same ds that we use to find currents through loops in Ampere's law. So I have this uh, path, and I have closed path uh, C that encloses an open surface S. 
So I have again closed path C. And closing the open surface now, it's not a closed surface. And it is an open surface. Closed surface means I have uh, this bottle here. If I open, if I take away the lid, it becomes an open surface. Imagine there is a bug uh, inside. If it can escape without uh, poking the surface, then the surface is open. Uh, if uh, it cannot do that, it has to uh, drill a hole in order to escape, then the surface is closed. For example, uh, closed cylinders, closed spheres that we have seen in Gauss's law are closed surfaces. I make this distinction because sometimes you come in from your mathematics courses and you think about closed and open surfaces in terms of closed and open sets, the ones that uh, contain the boundary points or don't contain the boundary points. This is not what we're talking about here. So this open surface simply means if I have a bug here, it can just escape from the surface without piercing the surface. That's all it means. So then the right hand side of this law is that this is equal to the time rate of change of magnetic flux B dot ds through the surface. So if there is time varying magnetic flux through the surface, then there will be an electromotive force uh, along the set, there will be a voltage, so to speak, along the surface. So this Faraday law, let me write it here. can be written in compact form as follows. As I said before, by mistake, a little bit prematurely, we call this not voltage, but electromotive force, EMF, VEMF, electromotive force. And we call this electromotive force rather than voltage to distinguish it from the voltage that you have seen in electrostatics that is associated with uh, conservative fields coming from static charge distributions. And you see that this here, this integral, is magnetic flux. So imagine you have magnetic field through the surface. And this is the magnetic flux, phi. So this EMF is equal to minus the time rate of change in the magnetic flux through the surface. And the magnetic flux, the sense of the flux, whether it is positive or negative, is defined by this ds. So you are free to trace the loop either um, clockwise or counterclockwise, whichever way you want. But once you determine how you trace it, then the ds is fixed. So if I trace it the other way, then my ds that I put in the law uh, is actually opposite. So you see that we have um, several cases where things that from a circuit perspective look like short circuits and we would not expect to see any current, they actually have current. One case is when I have, let's say, a closed loop like this within a time varying magnetic field, what we saw in the in uh, the first uh, demonstration, so stationary loop in a time varying magnetic field. So you see in this case we do have time varying uh, flux because the uh, field changes, the magnetic field changes. Or we can have a constant magnetic field
in this area, but now um, we have a moving frame with a velocity v. So in this case, the time, uh, the uh, magnetic flux through the circuit changes, although the, con the magnetic field is constant, because the circuit is changing. And uh, just to remind you, this can also happen in the case that you have uh, this uh, frame on a rotating, on a windmill. So imagine that this uh, rotates. And then you put this inside a magnet with a north and a south pole like this. So in this case, the magnetic field is constant. However, uh, still there is time varying flux through the loop. And of course, we can have a combination of the two. A combination of the two, for example, when you have uh, this uh, second case, of the loop that is moving within the magnetic field. And now this magnetic field is time varying. So now I have a combination of the two cases where I have both motion and I have a change in the magnetic field. So this type of electromotive force in Faraday's law is called transformer EMF. And we will see how this is associated with uh, transformers. Uh, this is called motional EMF. Because you see in this case, uh, the electromotive force is due to the motion of the circuit rather than the change in the magnetic flux. And you have the combined uh, case of motional plus, plus transformer in this uh, example. So this is what this means. It means the possibility of generating electric field without a battery, per se, without uh, static charge distributions. You see, in these cases, there is no static charges anywhere. Just like in uh, antennas in these access points, there is actually no static charges anywhere there. All these are dynamic. So this is what we see in Ampere's law, in sorry, Faraday's law, in Faraday's law. So any questions up to this point? Uh, I didn't understand the combination part. How does it is a, how does that become a combination? Of because I have both motion, but now also the magnetic field changes. So, so is it, it is moving like this, right? Yes, it is moving into the magnetic field. So even if the magnetic field was constant, the flux would change. But now the flux changes for two reasons, both because of the motion and because of the uh, time rate of change in the magnetic field. OK? So this is what it means. Yes, please. Sorry. I'm sorry. Is there any benefit in doing a combination of like design like that, rather than just doing transformer or just notional? It's not a matter of uh, uh, benefit. Uh, we will see in examples how, what kinds of signals you can generate by the one way or the other. But in most cases, it's a matter of analysis that you have, uh, let's say, one particular case where this happens is, and I think I mentioned it last week, um, when a plane lands, when a plane lands, uh, it goes through a very sensitive phase uh, uh, in, in terms of the safety of the onboard electronics. Why? Because uh, it goes through strong magnetic fields that are generated by systems that are on the ground. And they are radar systems, communication systems for cellular communications, and communications of the airport and defense facilities that usually are around the airports. So what happens in this case is you have the combined EMF. So the airport, uh, the, uh, the airplane lands. Inside, there are circuits. Circuits that control things like uh, the radars, uh, GPS, landing, uh, and so on. And uh, those intercept time-varying magnetic flux. 
And therefore, you have this combined case because you have both motion and you have time varying flux because those radar systems are typically in the gigahertz area or also weather radar uh, is in the gigahertz area. So there is induced now voltage because of that, which from the perspective of the onboard electronics, it is noise. And it is noise that can knock out the electronics. So that's why uh, there is this area of electromagnetic compatibility and interference where the engineers need to certify that the electronics, will, the electronic systems on board will remain operable when they are exposed to those fields on the ground upon landing and takeoff, same, same situation. So it's not a matter of a benefit or not benefit, but many times it's a matter of analysis of the effect where this uh, comes up as a combined uh, EMF. Okay, so now that we sort of have an idea what does this mean, uh, let's see how we can apply this law in order to find those currents or to find those noise signals uh, in this case of uh, the aircraft electronics. So I will do that through a concrete example. So this is uh, my example. So a simple circuit, this is a case of transformer uh, EMF with a resistor. And uh, let's uh, give this a length L and a height H. And that is now within a magnetic field that comes out of the board, or it can go into the board. Let me uh, clarify here. So the Z axis comes out of the board, and the magnetic field is Z hat B naught cosine omega T. So it has a time varying profile. So whenever we have a diagram like this, we simply mean that when the cosine is positive, the magnetic field will be coming out of the board, will be in the Z direction. So now we're talking about time varying stuff. And therefore, um, this direction is a direction of reference. It means that when the magnetic field is positive, then it will come out of the board, will be in the Z direction. But you see that the cosine will be oscillating. Just like in uh, sources that you draw in circuit diagrams, so when you draw a source like this, a time varying source in a circuit diagram, okay, when you do this, when you put the plus here and the minus here, you don't mean that necessarily the potential on this side will be greater than the potential on this side. You need to define your reference for this voltage so that when this voltage is cosine omega t, you know whether this is uh, V2 minus V1 or V1 minus V2. So that you know if it is positive, which way does the current flow? And likewise, you can find if it is negative, which way does the current flow? So that is what I mean by this diagram, uh, that the magnetic field is in the Z direction if this cosine is positive. So now from a circuit perspective, this looks like a plain um, short circuit that is not supposed to have any current. However, Faraday law says that there will be a current. And uh, the magnetic flux, uh, to find the electromotive force, first of all, we need to define a sense of tracing the loop. Uh, let me trace the loop counterclockwise, like this.
So this is the way I trace the loop. Once now I have this, then my associated DS comes out of the board. So I call this uh, rule that I have drawn there the right hand rule, whereby I'm using my right hand to trace the loop the way that I intend to trace it. And then my right hand thumb uh, shows the direction of DS. So that is what I call here the right, right hand rule. So this DS, in this case, uh, points in the Z direction. So therefore, it will be dx dy. Of course, in this case, the magnetic flux is very easy to calculate because the magnetic field does not change in space. It is totally uniform. So as you see, uh, the magnetic flux will be b times the area of the loop. So then the magnetic flux will be b dot ds over this uh, area. So the magnetic field is b naught cosine omega t. The ds is z hat dx dy. z dot z is equal to 1. And therefore, I have b naught cosine omega t, area integral over the loop, which is basically length times height of the loop. So it's L times h. So this is my time varying magnetic flux. Faraday's law, though, invokes not the flux itself, but its time rate of change. So therefore, I differentiate this just to have it ready. So d phi by dt is equal to the derivative, basically, of the cosine times the other constants, which is minus omega b naught l h sine of omega t. Okay. So just so that I don't carry all these constants, let me call this um, phi naught sine omega t. Okay. So now I need to apply Faraday's law. And that is the fourth step. So you see minus minus gives me a plus. And then I have an EMF that is sinusoidal. I have an EMF that is sinusoidal. As we said before, this EMF acts as a virtual source. So I need to go back to my circuit and add it as a source. But now I need to understand the polarity of that virtual source. And this is perhaps the uh, most sensitive part in the application, the practical application of the law. So I can add this source here to my uh, diagram, either as a source that has the plus here and the minus there, or the minus there and the plus here. So which choice is the right one? The right choice is revealed by the definition of the EMF. So to find the polarity, I basically look at the definition of the EMF, which is E dot DL. So this here is a dot product, E dot DL. 
the dot product of two vectors is positive when the two vectors are co-directional. And it is negative when the two vectors are contradirectional. So this EMF will be positive when electric field and DL are positive. Okay. When the electric field, in other words, points in the direction I'm tracing the loop. So when the electric field points in the direction I'm tracing the loop, the associated current will also be pointing in the same direction. That is, because remember, from Ohm's law, electric field is current density divided by conductivity. So all in all, this EMF is a source or acts as a voltage source that if it is positive, So again, remember, here we're talking about time-varying effects, just like in time-varying circuits. Okay? So the EMF, the voltages and currents, can be positive or negative over time. So this argument tells you that if the EMF is positive, then it will drive current in the direction you are tracing the loop. So in the same direction, you chose to trace the loop. So here, I'm tracing the loop this way. I, that was my convention. I'm tracing the loop this way. So a source that would drive a current this way would have to have its positive pole on this side and the negative pole on this side. So that is how the EMF has to be added so that out of the law I can get the correct current at the end. So the EMF, you see, to summarize, I chose to trace the loop like this. And that means that the EMF that I will compute has to be entered like this into my circuit. Remember, it acts as a virtual source, so now I have to compute a current. To compute a current, I have to put it in the circuit. Uh, the resistor here, obviously, doesn't change. And this source, indeed, would drive a current in the direction that I'm tracing the loop. OK, so this is now uh, my circuit complete with the EMF. And I have already found this EMF. So there will be a current, as you see, and that current will be the EMF divided by R. So it will be um, omega, let me put everything there so that you have it in your notes, L h divided by r sine omega t. So it's a sinusoidal current. So at this point, I have finished the analysis and the application of the law. Uh, so before I uh, continue with some other comments, any questions up to this point? So you see, I realize that this EMF acts as a virtual source. The original Kirchhoff's laws 
cannot help me calculate the current. Because you see, if I look at the circuit, I find current equals zero. There is no source. So therefore, I have to add the source, which is found through Faraday's law. And the question is, what's the correct polarity? So this is the rule in order to find the correct polarity. Yes, please. Uh, I was kind of curious, how did you figure out that omega P naught LH is the value of uh, flux, flux zero or whatever? Uh, I, I, I uh, did the derivative, sorry, where is exactly your question? No, I just want to know why exactly that is the value of uh, like flux naught, like omega B. So this one is the area, this is L times H. And then uh, at this stage, I simply differentiate the cosine. That gives me minus omega sine omega T. Uh, this is a symbol. It doesn't mean anything. It's a symbol. It's not the flux. The flux is the whole thing. Okay? It's just a symbol. And this is the current. Okay? And this is the current. So uh, the other thing to observe now is that my, this induced current produces its own magnetic field as well. The reason being that uh, the reason being that it acts as a magnetic dipole itself. So we have a closed loop that produces a current and uh, that itself produces a magnetic field. And this brings me to uh, an observation on Faraday's law, which uh, is called Lenz's law, and it is more like a check of whether we have done these calculations correctly. So here is, the, here is a plot that shows how the magnetic flux relates to this current. Since the magnetic flux uh, density is uh, period, the magnetic flux is a periodic function of time, I will uh, sketch the magnetic flux over one period only. So this is uh, t over 4, this is t over 2, 3 t over 4, and t. So obviously this pattern repeats over time. So we see that this flux is basically a cosine. So I can plot it here. It is a cosine. It looks like this. and then periodically repeats. Okay. So then, when this cosine is positive, the external field points in the z direction. So I will uh, make a diagram as well of the field that induces this flux. So it is in the z direction when the cosine is positive. When the cosine is negative, then it goes into the board. And then when the cosine is again positive, it comes out of the board. So this is the magnetic field that has created this entire effect. The direction of the magnetic field that has created this entire effect. So now let's look at the current that we have found. The current is now sinusoidal. The current is sinusoidal. So let me uh, draw it with a different uh, color. So the current varies like this. Okay. So in other words, when it is positive, the current, so remember all these quantities, currents, voltages, are algebraic quantities. So what does it mean when the current is positive? It means that it flows in the direction that we assumed. So it flows really counterclockwise. So in this case, the current flows this way when it is positive. When it is negative, 
What does it mean the current becomes negative? It means that it flows against the direction that we have assumed. So we assumed this direction being counterclockwise. If the current is negative, that means it actually the actual direction that it flows is clockwise. Okay. So it's a magnetic dipole itself from for the first half of its period of oscillation, it produces a magnetic field that points this way. And in the second half of its oscillation, it produces a magnetic field that points into the board. So now we're talking about a secondary, an induced magnetic field produced by the induced current. And this is what is called Lenz's law. It is this following observation that when the magnetic field is in the first quarter of a period, you see that it points out of the board, the external magnetic field. However, the magnetic flux through the circuit is actually reducing. So the magnetic flux through the circuit is reducing. So the, the secondary, the induced magnetic field from the loop, actually points in the same direction as the external flux. It works to reinforce it. So what it, it actually resists the tendency of the magnetic flux to reduce and points in the direction of the external field. This is a sensitive point because what is called Lenz's law many times is misinterpreted that you induce a, the external field induces a current on the loop, and that current produces on its own a magnetic field that is against the external magnetic field. And that is not the true interpretation of this phenomenon. You see now the uh, induced magnetic field works to resist the change in the flux. Here the change in the flux is reduction in the flux, and therefore the magnetic field that is induced will actually be induced in such a way to resist this change, which is a reduction. And therefore, it will add to the external field. Here in the, so in the second quarter, what happens? Now the external field has changed polarity and becomes more and more uh, negative that is stronger and stronger in the opposite direction. So now the induced field comes out of the board and tries to reduce this new trend in the magnetic flux. So again, the, uh, uh, the field, the induced field, the induced magnetic field, is against the external B that gets stronger in the opposite direction now. And you can follow uh, the same trend in the other quarters in this diagram. And that brings me to the statement of the law.
so in fact, there is no Lenz's law. Lenz's law is a consequence of Faraday's law. So if you apply Faraday's law correctly, if you apply, so it is more of a sanity check that everything has been done correctly. So if you calculate the currents correctly, which we did here, and you see now this is a check on my convention on the polarity of the EMF. So if you do this correctly, then you should see that the current that you are calculating acts against, I emphasize, not the external magnetic field, but the change in the external magnetic field. Very sensitive point, a lot of misunderstanding about this. So you see in this first quarter, the induced magnetic field and the external are actually pointing in the same direction. Why? Because the external magnetic field tends to reduce and the induced field reinforces it in order to resist in this reduction. So that is uh, what we need to observe if we apply Faraday's law correctly. So this is more like a sanity check on the correct application of Faraday's law rather than a law in and of itself. Okay. So any questions up to this point? Okay, so here is uh, another example. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. The magnitude of D phi over DT is decreased. Uh, that, uh, that's right. Well, here it is negative, yeah. Phi decreases through the loop in this case over time. D phi by DT is negative. Yeah. So, so when you mean by the Lenz law, right? So whenever the uh, phi T decreases, right, it doesn't do anything to, like, uh, change its initial state, but whenever that state starts to change, it's, uh, it gives like additional magnetic field to compensate that. Is that how it The works? induced current produces a magnetic field that uh, adds, adds to the external. Yeah, compensates, indeed, compensates. It's a, it's a, a good word. Okay, so here is an example with uh, numbers. So let's say that we have a circuit, just like the one before, uh, with a resistor, 120 ohms, and a resistor here, 80 ohms. And this is uh, inside the magnetic field. So it is same situation as the one before, just with numbers. So the magnetic field, the magnetic flux density here is uh, in the z direction, 10 to minus 3 uh, cosine 2 times 10 to the 8th pi uh, t. So t is time, by the way, and uh, the units of magnetic flux are Tesla. Uh, by the way, the, the magnetic field of the Earth is in the area of 10 to minus 4 Tesla. MRI machines in the 1 uh, to 5 to 10 uh, for experimental machines, Tesla. So that gives you an idea of what uh, um, kind, what Tesla means. So here we have a, a small uh, magnetic flux uh, comparable to that of, uh, of, of the Earth. And uh, the question is, what are the voltages here, V1 and V2? Uh, if the length and the height are both one centimeter. Okay, so we have here L equals H equal to one centimeter. So the flux through, it's exactly the same, I'm just putting numbers. The flux through the circuit will be 10 to minus 3 cosine so this is the magnetic flux density. And then we have an area which is one by one centimeter squared. 
So it is 10 to minus 4 meters squared. So this is uh, 10 to minus 7 cosine of 2 times 10 to the 8th pi times t. So you see we have a 100 megahertz signal here. This is the frequency of uh, the signal. to pi f. So d phi by dt then will be minus 2 times 10 to the 8th pi times 10 to minus 7 sine. So it is this uh, minus uh, sine that we have found before. 10 to the 8th, 10 to minus 7 gives you a factor of 10. So I have minus 20 pi sine 2 times 10 to the 8th pi t. Okay, so this is my time rate of change of the flux through the circuit, which means that there will be an EMF, and that EMF will be minus that and that means it will be plus 20 pi sine pi t. So now I have to put in the EMF. Uh, by the way, I followed the same convention as before. So I have traced the loop like this. That's why I found this flux as, flux as positive, because my ds points in the direction of the magnetic field. So I simply uh, multiplied b by the area. to find the flux. And now I can put the EMF on the circuit. This is the EMF. And that means I have a current I that is the EMF divided by the total resistance, which is 120 plus 80. So you see here I have now Ohm's law. Voltage divided by total resistance. Total resistance is 200, 120 plus 80. And that gives me uh, 0.1. So 20 by 200 gives me 0.1 pi sine of 2 times 10 to the 8th pi t. So this is the current. This is V1. This is V2. So you see V1 is I times R1. V2, look how it has been defined. V2 is from here to here. The current comes in like this. So V2 is minus I R2. So multiplying my current by 120 ohms gives me the first voltage, 12 pi sign of uh, this. And then this one is minus 8 pi sine of this. So you see the presence of the EMF with Faraday's law means that these resistors are not in parallel anymore. You see them uh, in parallel. You may assume that V1 is equal to V2. The presence of the electromotive force through Faraday's law means they are not parallel anymore. That uh, challenges your conventional view of circuits. Once the, mag the electromotive force is there, now you have to find the current and then calculate the voltages. So I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention. We'll continue uh, on Wednesday.